Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Great. Doing good. It was a good time of worship and ministry. Amen. Good. To, you guys awake? Hello. All right. Hey, I want to tell you real quick. Um, to uh, uh, how many remember Pastor Jamie? Do you remember Pastor Jamie? He is my brother from another mother. He is a black pastor that will dehunkify us. And how many know you guys are honkies? You really are because how many know I say to you guys, Amen, and you go, Amen. But when Jamie said, come on, talk to me, amen, you went, amen, hallelujah. You guys were dehonkified. So I want to see that again. So if you like to have that, are you, look at this, you're just not going to laugh, are you? You're not going to do it. Um, but I'll tell you, it's so neat. I, I, I got to tell you this story real quick, how it happened. We went there because I found out it was Pastor Chuck's old church. He said that was his church that he said he took it from a solid 57 and brought it down to a solid 25. Okay, so even Pastor Truck, who struggled, he brought his church down, and he, he, uh, he said that he learned a lot in uh, this church in Tucson, and if you want to see it, it's really neat. I showed Pastor Jamie, but the movie Adventure of Faith, it's online, it shows kind of the Calvary movement, how it happened, and it shows Pastor Chuck with old 8 millimeter waddling out of the, you know, because 8 millimeter kind of stutter, but he was coming out of the church, and you see the very church that we're going to meet at tonight. And it was pretty neat going and praying with Pastor Jamie in the office where Pastor Chuck uh, spent many years. He was there, I think, for, th- well, not many years, but three years there. He used to jump around a lot, but uh, so cool. But it was neat. We went there, and, and my son Morgan, who leads worship, he, uh, was uh, having a football banquet at the U of A. And so it was on a Wednesday night, so we missed Wednesday night service. So after about 8.30, I said, hey, let's go check the church out. They have a Wednesday night service. Let's go there. Well, we went there, and it was really neat. It's another neat experience. We went there, and all of a sudden, all the ushers just circled around me. And my daughter goes, dad, 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 we, we, we need to, dad, we need to go. Dad, dad, dad. And I guess what happened, there was a guy who looked like me who came and caused trouble at the church. So they thought I was that guy. And so they were all circling around me. And, uh, and then they said, this is kind of cool. They said, the apostle will see you. And I was like, whoa, I don't, I don't need to see the apostle. I just want to see the church. But Pastor Jamie came out. He's also apostle, Pastor Jamie. But uh, he came out and we, he recognized me from the radio when I used to be on the radio. And so it's been a great friendship ever since. And uh, I encourage you. Just It's so neat to have a friend like that. I just appreciate Pastor Jamie so, so much, and I encourage you. I know it's a hike, but it's worth it. If you want to know how to do it, here's how you go. You go down Oracle, River, then River to First, First to, wait, wait, no, 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 that's not right. See, (laughs) just Google it, because I'll mess it up. But anyways, when you get down to Campbell, it's just, you just hit six, take uh, a left on I have to go like this. Take a left on six, and then three streets down, it'll be on Plummer, Sixth and Plummer. And it's a little church with a dirt parking lot. It's pretty cute. And uh, just uh, if you could come, that'd be awesome. It's such a great time there. And such brothers that love and sisters that love the Lord with all their heart. If you're a Bible, please turn with me to Daniel chapter 3, verse 19. Daniel chapter 3, verse 19. And the title of today's message is, and hopefully you understand it later, is Fire Freeze Us. Fire Freeze Us. And we're going to see, hopefully you understand what that means. How many of you like to hear a joke today? Anyone want to hear a joke? Want to hear a joke? All right, here we go. I'll see if I can do it. I'm trying to beat Kevin, so help me out. Laugh, get courtesy laugh. But this man said, I finally found out what is wrong with my brain. And he said, the left side, and the left side, there's nothing right. And on the right side, there's nothing left. There you go. Weak? Okay. You'll get in the parking lot of you going, left, left, right, left brain, left, you know. Anyway, I thought it was funny. Let's pray before I get in any more trouble. Father, thank you so much for this day, and thank you for just ministering to us of your love. That, Lord, you said the greatest gift is love. Lord, so many times we pursue other things like prophecy and the gift of teaching and uh, the gift of administration and all these other things. But, Lord, you said the greatest gift is to love you and to love each other with your love. That's, that's, That's the greatest, two greatest gifts. 
And so, God, I ask that we would be those men and women that want to love you with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength. And that as we're filled with you, the God of love, then we would just give that love away to those around us. Love our neighbors or near ones, that means in the Greek, the near ones. Love them with your love. And that's our prayer. That we would not just be hearers of the word. We wouldn't just know the word. But we would be effectual doers. We would really love you by loving others around us. So Father, bless this church with the gift of love. Bless this church with the greatest gift of all, love. That's one of the greatest testimonies of a church is really your church is when they love you in worship and then they love each other with your love, with your acts of love and kindness. So Father, let us be a church that doesn't just do good works to be saved, but we do good works. We do works out of love because we are saved. Amen? And so, Father, thank you for this day. I ask that right now your Holy Spirit would just continue to move. Just continue. I pray that you would anoint every ear and anoint every heart to hear what your Holy Spirit is saying to them. That whatever they need to hear, that you would just, I pray you'd speak a rhema word, a specific word for a specific time, for a specific people at a specific place, that they would just hear from you and they'd be never the same. And I pray that you would anoint my tongue to say exactly what you want to say. Nothing more than you want, but most definitely nothing less. I would not shrink back from preaching the whole counsel of God because it's maybe not politically correct or it's not socially correct. I pray that I would live and we would be people who live, would say according to your word, let God be true and every man be a liar. Amen? And that we would want your truth, we would want to live a life of truth according to your word, not what the society says, not what the TV says, not what the U of A says, but what your holy word says. So give us a love for your word. Give us a love to walk in your truths. We thank you for this time, and we commit it to you in Jesus' most powerful name. And everyone agreed, said, Amen. Amen. Verse 19 of Daniel chapter 3. And let me give you a little background here for those of you who might weren't, maybe weren't here last week. Uh, quick background so you can get the tapes or online free or the CDs. But first, the, it wasn't, I'm okay. tape CDs. Yeah, tapes, you can tell I'm old right there. Tapes. So it's like eight tracks now, tapes. Isn't that funny? But uh, when we were young, it was eight tracks. Now it's tapes. But. Um, First, first, you have Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. He took captive Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel. Then he gets this dream, and he sees this huge statue. And he sees in the statue, it's a big statue, and has all these different metals in it. And I'm only going to tell you two metals, but it basically has a head of gold, which we saw was King Nebuchadnezzar was the Babylonian kingdom, the head of gold. And then Daniel... He had this dream, but then Daniel interpreted it and said, the head of gold is you, King Nebuchadnezzar. And at that time, he was the most powerful man in the known world. But then he says what's going to happen is there's going to be a, a chest of silver and arms of silver that's going to defeat you. And that's going to be the Medes and the Persians. That's why two arms, the Medes and the Persians, they kind of combined together and they overthrew Babylon. Well, now as we got to chapter 2, we saw, or chapter 3, we see now uh, that it's about 20 years from when Daniel interpreted his dream. So it's as if, Dan, as if uh, Nebuchadnezzar is saying, you know what, you prophesied to me in my dream that I would be defeated, but now I don't want to be defeated. I, well, I don't think he wanted to be ever, but he said, I'm not going to be defeated. So now King Nebuchadnezzar has made this 90-foot tall statue of solid gold, of gold, maybe not solid gold, but gold-plated wood probably, gold, and says to everyone, you worship this image. And if you don't worship this image, then anyone who does not, when the trumpet plays and the flute and all the instruments, when the music plays, if you do not bow down and worship me or worship my image, you will be killed. You'll be thrown into a fiery furnace. And so this is where we pick it up today. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel's away on business, most scholars believe. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the Jewish three Jewish kids, they said that our God can deliver us. They were going to throw him into a fiery furnace. Our God can deliver us from this fiery furnace. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down and worship your image. 
How many know we need some strength like that today? We need some resolve to say, I will not worship the things of this world. I will not worship MTV. Well, that's not nerdy now. But I will not worship things in the world. I will worship the one true God and Him only will I serve. So this is where we pick up today. So he's, they basically told King Nebi, sorry, I call him Neb- Nebi for short, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, Nebi. So when you hear that, you won't think, you'll say, what is that? But here it is, verse 19, here's King Nebuchadnezzar's response when they said no to his worshiping his image. And oh, let me say this real quick too. <clears throat> King Nebuchadnezzar is a type, a type of an anti- the Antichrist. He is a type of the Antichrist because we'll see that just as the last days, remember Daniel is also telling history of what happened there about 300 B.C., but then it's also prophesying what will happen in the last days right now. And what's going to happen is just like De- uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, make an image that you worship my image. So how many know in Revelation 13, the Antichrist will make an image in the temple and he'll say, worship this image or, and take the mark of this image, the beast, or you will what? Die. So it's a picture. Do you see it? A typology of what has happened and what will come. And so we're going to see that a lot today because the book of Daniel is so prophetic that a lot of scholars, secular scholars, say there's no way it could have been written so far long, you know, 300 years before Christ because it's so accurate. How many know God knows all things? He knows the beginning and the end. Today is the beginning of Adam and Eve. There is no time with God. It's just all at one time. I mean, how many know that? It, time is now. You know, even Einstein said, if you travel at the speed of light, time is relative. It's right now, everything. And how many know God sees the beginning and the end? He knows your whole life. So don't ever think God's going, what do I do with Craig? You know, he knows exactly what he wants to do. I just have to get in his will. Amen. But he has a great plan for you because he's a good, good father. Yes, he is. That's no, okay. I'll leave that for Morgan. Here it is, verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed, kind of his face altered, towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. Does that number seven mean anything to you in the last days? What's going to happen in the last days? Seven-year tribulation. There you go. The fiery furnace. Seven-year tribulation. Now, again, it's typology here. Some people say, oh, come on. Seriously? No, really. Seven times more than it was usually heated. How many know the tribulation is going to be a great time of outpouring of tribulation and fire on the earth. I mean, one-third of the population is going to die. That means right now, two billion people would be killed instantly, or a little over two billion probably. But how many know, that's going to be the fire that is poured out, and it's going to be a time of great tribulation. And hear this, guys. Some people say, well, how do you think we're going to miss it? You know, we believe in a pre-rapture, a pre-trib rapture. We're going to rapture before the tribulation. But hear this, what I tell people. They'll say, well, the church has suffered. Why would God pull us out before suffering? Because the, the, the suffering the church goes through right now is the suffering of Satan. How many know that? The devil persecuting the church. But how many know in the tribulation, it won't just be the devil doing some hard things. It'll be God. Read the end of Revelation 6. It'll be God pouring out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. And if you remember, I said, I told you, that no one dies today and goes to hell because of sin. They go to hell in separation from God because they did not receive the payment for sin, which is what? Jesus Christ. That's it. Read John 3.18. You know, we know John 3.16, 3.18 says it's because they rejected the one and only Son. That's why. How many know the debt has been paid for everyone? But it's up to you and I, do we receive that gift? Do we receive God's forgiveness, the love of the Father? And how many know God gives you free will? You can reject a loving Father. And that's why it's so important, no matter what your earthly father has done to you, that you do not let that devil deceive you to say, that's the way God is too. Because he's not. What broke your heart broke his heart. But because he gives people, say, well, then why does God allow it? Because God allows free will. How many know that that's the... That's the good and bad of free will. Isn't it amazing? We, we get mad when God doesn't let us do something. But then we get mad when he lets people do things. 
Amen? And we've got to realize that's a part of having free will, is that people have the right, or freedom, I should say, to do harsh things. But anyways, Nebuchadnezzar, the, his, his face has changed. The only thing hotter than the fiery furnace was Nebuchadnezzar's, Nebuchadnezzar's or Nebi's angry face. Verse 20. And he commanded certain mighty men of value. So hear this, mighty men. These were the macho men. These were the strong men. They were right next to the king. So these were his, his navy seals. These are his most powerful men who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Verse 21. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other, uh, other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Verse 22. Therefore, because, the king, because of the king's command was, so, was urgent, the fire and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flames of the fire killed, hear that, killed those men, those men of valor, who took up Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. Isn't that wild? The men that threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, it was so hot that they were burned and killed in the process. Do you know how hot that fire has to be? I don't know if you've ever, I used to love, you know, I used to love making fires huge. I used to camp a lot with my aunt, and you know, most people make little fires. I made fires. I mean, I would go get, I mean, I'd make fires this big to where you'd have to stand back like about 20 feet because, uh, wow, it was a fire. And so, can you imagine how hot that fire had to be to kill the men who threw them in. They didn't go in the fire. They just threw them in, and it was so hot that they died in the process. And that should be a testimony to us of how bad the tribulation is going to be. I've heard people say, and they're not here anymore, but I heard this one person came here for a little while, and he said, I, I, I want to go through the tribulation because then I'll know God is real. And how many know that it says in, I believe it's first, uh, Second Thessalonians, I think, 2, where he talks about that those who are in the church, you know, that's the one part. you got to be careful with getting your theology from movies. How many know the Left Behind series? You see the pastor then gets saved and all the people, and they realize, oh, my. How many know that the Bible doesn't say that? The Bible says that if those who don't hear now that are in the church and they don't receive Christ now, they will probably be deceived and they'll probably go with the false church, the religious Babylon. That should scare us. And I mean, God bless, I love the Left Behind series, but how many know that's not biblical because it says that those who don't, re it says that God will give them a strong delusion because they rejected the truth. There's a reason why Jesus says, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Because you're not guaranteed tomorrow to receive Christ. So today, when you feel the Spirit call you, when you feel the Spirit drawing you, it, today's the day to surrender your life fully to God. Amen? Amen? Verse 23. These three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Now think about that. They, the guys that just threw them in died, but now they're bound, tied up, and thrown in, fall on the floor. Now think how hot that floor had to be of that furnace. I mean, that had to be hot, but they're falling down. So they're not just stancing the fire. They actually fell down in the fire. Verse 24, the, then King Nebi was astonished. He rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men can you imagine he's thinking, I'm getting old here. What's going on? Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Verse 25, Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth, I like how the king, New King James says it, is like the Son of God. How many like that? God is with them in the midst of fire. Nebuchadnezzar asked, how many, how many men did we throw in the fire? Three men. Came the answer. And then he says, oh, how come I see a fourth man? Fourth looking like the Son of God. He could tell there was something very different about this fourth man. This fiery trial was not just a miracle, but it was also a testimony to a skeptical, angry, unbelieving king, King Nebuchadnezzar, who said, I want to set up a statue because I don't want my kingdom to die. It was a testimony 
when he saw Jesus in the fire along with these three Jewish young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How many know that when you go through a fire and when you, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, can see Jesus in the midst of your fiery trial, how many know that's a testimony to people? It's a testimony of the reality of God and the realness of God. How many know there should be a difference between us going through a trial and a non-Christian going through a trial? And I want to say, sadly, sometimes we're a lot like the world, but there should be a real distinction as it was for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Verse 26. Then King Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the fire, the burning fiery furnace. Notice he went near, not real close because it's so hot. The burning fiery furnace and spoke saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants. Now notice this change here. Servants of the Most High God. I like that. When you see people dancing in fire, you say, hey, so your God is God. It's pretty amazing. Okay, Most High God. Come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, or sorry, Shadrach, Meshach, came, came from the midst of the fire. Verse 27, and the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the kings, counselors gathered together and they saw these men whose bodies the fire had no power. I like that. How many know with God, no power over the thing? If God doesn't want anything to touch you, nothing can touch you. No power. The fire that killed these seven, these men that threw them in had no power over them. No power whatsoever. I like this next part. The hair of their head was not singed. How many know the Bible says he knows the number of hairs on our head? Some of you, it doesn't take a lot to count, right? Like me, it's getting less and less every year. But how many know God knows every hair on your head? And he cares so much about it, he didn't even allow the, the, the fire furnace to singe their hair. Not even touch it. And you know how quickly hair burns in fire. Didn't even touch it. And hear this. Nor were their garments affected and the smell of fire was not on them. I love what one commentator said. He goes, I can't even go to Denny's without having the smell of Denny's on me. I haven't been to Denny's lately. I don't know the smell of Denny's. But anyways, sounds interesting. But how many know this? If you've ever been camping you know, you smell your clothes, you smell your jean jacket. It smells like smoke. It smells like fire. This is an amazing miracle because not even a hair was singed, not even the smell of smoke was on them. And here they're in the midst of the fiery furnace. In addition to, hear this, burning off the ropes that bound them and letting others see that in their fiery trials, the opportunity that, that, that they were praising God or trusting God in their trials, it is also, hear this, an opportunity for us and for them to draw closer to the Lord than we would have otherwise, otherwise done. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have rather, hear this, been in the fire with Jesus than out of the fire without him. I'll tell you this. Most of us here, can you raise your hand? How many do not like trials? Amen? There you go. Pretty much everyone, unless you're a weirdo. But anyways, and no one likes trials, but I'll hear, tell you this. I'm realizing that that's part of Christianity. I'm realizing it. It's only taken me 34 years of Christianity, but I realize that the way I really know Jesus is through the trials. Oh, how I'd love to be wise enough to love him in the good times and just seek him just as intensely in the good times as I do the trials, but I'll tell you this. It's not true. I don't. No matter how much I want to, I don't a lot because guess what? It was when I had the trial of hearing that my wife had cancer that all of a sudden I realized I looked at my life with God and I really started praying and God showed me in that fiery trial and that we're still going through but God is doing amazing things and I appreciate your continued prayer. There was three lumps Two of them are not cancerous. The one still is. She doesn't have the gene that would pass it on to our kids, so there's two praises. But how many know we're believing God? I'm pray praying for another aut or autopsy, uh, biopsy, not an autopsy. That's not good. That's not faith. But another autopsy, <clears throat> or autopsy, biopsy. <laughs> What's going on? I don't like you. No, biopsy that will determine that I believe she's healed. 
She said she used to feel pain in her side and she hasn't felt it for two weeks, so I'm believing God for healing. Amen? How many know God can still heal? And so uh, we're going to pray for that and believe God for that. So pray that we could get another biopsy for that to, to confirm that. But I'll tell you this, in that fiery trial, you know, my wife has learned some things, but I'll tell you, I've learned that, you know, we all know as men, as husbands, we all know Ephesians 5, of husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself or laid his life down for her. And the Lord really spoke to me that I have been failing in that. That I've, a lot of times I've put the ministry before my wife. And I've just been too busy at times. And God has really spoke to me. So my point I'm trying to make is that it was in that fiery trial that woke me up to things that I wouldn't see if everything was going good. And so how do I say this lovingly? I get kind of fearful saying this. But I'm not saying, God, bring trials! But I'm saying is, if I have to learn through a trial, then so be it. Now, I'd like to be a wise man. I love what one person said. Wise men learn from others' mistakes. Fools learn from their own mistakes. Why do you think the Bible shows everyone's failures? Go so we can go, I don't want to do that. Right? And that's what I pray. I pray that I can learn in the good times, but I'll tell you, I'm kind of, I feel like Forrest Gump a lot of times. I'm not a smart man. But I know fiery trials will make you smart because they'll make you seek God. Amen? So it gives the opportunity for us to draw close to the Lord than we would otherwise in the good times or easy times. Shadrach, Meshach, and Menego would have rather, as I said, been in the fire with Jesus than out of the fire without him. That's why they stayed there until Nebuchadnezzar called them to come out. How many know that, you know, sometimes, I, I don't want to explain this to you if this will make sense. It probably won't. But uh, I, I fasted a couple of weeks ago, and I remember I was telling my, my daughter was fasting with me, and I remember I was saying that I, when you fast and really have a time with God, a lot of times I feel guilty eating. Now, you got to realize I love eating, as you can tell. Okay, but you get to where, but how many know sometimes in the fiery trial, when you have that closeness with God, sometimes you go, man, I, I mean, I don't like it, but I kind of like it. Does that make sense? How many have gone through a trial and afterwards you go, that was bad, but it really wasn't so bad because God was with me. And so I hope that makes sense to you. When do we really see the Lord? More often than not, it's when we're in the midst, as I said, in the fiery trials of life. Now I want to kind of show you prophetically some of the things in chapter 3 that I think are pretty interesting for those of you who are kind of... Uh, really into prophecy. And how many know we should be into prophecy because we're living prophecy. And I mean, I believe we really could be the generation that sees the Lord's return. How many would love to be that part of that, right? Come on, Jesus. I'd love to be just, you, you're a good, good father. Hey, there you are, Father. I mean, I'd love to, you know, just be raptured right into his presence. That'd be pretty cool. But prophetically, chapter three speaks of the time, the Jews, and the, it's talking of the Jews in the last days represented by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. As they took their stand in the fiery trial of, of King Nebuchadnezzar going through the fiery furnace, so it's also a picture of the Jews and those tribulation saints that take a stand in the tribulation period. According to Revelation 17 and 18, the end times there will be a unified religious system. There will also be a unified economic system that are both what? They're called what? Babylon. There will be religious Babylon, the the false church, and how many know we're seeing that? How many know our latest pope, I mean, I used to be Catholic, so I can speak about it, but our latest pope just supposedly said that, that Jesus isn't the only way to God. And he's kind of embraced homosexuality. So a very liberal pope. And how many know that religious system, I'm not saying the, I'm not saying the pope's the Antichrist, don't hear that, but part of me know there's going to be a religious system that welcomes a one a world new order. Of, of a religious system of saying all religions are equal. Amen? And that's the religious Babylon. Then there will also be the, the economic Babylon. And where is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? In Babylon. What will be in the last days? Economic and religious Babylon. Where are the Jews in Daniel 3? They're in Babylon. Babylon. Just as King Nebi made an image and commanded the people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and all of them to bow to it, in the tribulation period, now remember this is typology, 
tribulation period, Antichrist will make an image and command everyone to bow to it. That's found in Revelation 13. Initially, King Nebuchadnezzar treated Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel very well, the Jews. But the Antichrist will also initially come on the scene as the what? The man of peace. The man who, you know, some theologians or some scholars say that he'll unify the kind of the Muslims and the Jews. And you say, what? I think I've told you this before, if not, but on the Temple Mount, where the Dome of the Rock is, some theologians say that where the Dome of the Rock is, is the outer court. And remember it says in Isaiah, set aside the outer court. For the Gentiles, there's the Dome of the Rock. But if you look right here, if you look kind of from the Mount of Olives looking down, here's the Dome of the Rock. But there's also this little archway with three arches, and that's called the Arch of the Spirits or Arch of the Tablets. And some theologians believe, and this is a theory, so don't take this as Bible, but they believe that that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. So the temple, so where the Dome of the Rock is, the temple was over here to the right. So what they believe is possibly the Antichrist could make a peace treaty where he could make a wall and the, in the you know, kind of like Coke and Pepsi commercial, right? There could be the, the Muslim Dome of the Rock here and there could be the Jewish temple right next to it. Now, I don't know about you, but that's hard to believe, isn't it? I told you I went and talked to the head guy, I forget his name, the rabbi who's, he's, I forget his name, but he's the head of the Sanhedrin. How many know the Sanhedrin started, I think, in 2010? But I asked him, I said, I showed him, you could see right from the Temple Institute. I, I said, so what about that little dome right there? And he goes, the dome of the abomination? That's what he called it. And he says, it must be removed. But he says, they've already had people up there with bombs ready to blow it up. Jewish people. But he said, we've stopped them. The Jewish police have stopped them because they know that's the third most holy place. That could cause a world war. And so they say no to that. But how many know that wouldn't that be an amazing man that could bring peace to the Muslims and the Jews? Amen? So that's a kind of an interesting theory. Amen? So there that. So, but this, this Antichrist will initially come on as a man of peace. But his true colors will show three and a half years into tribulation. Remember, it's the tribulation, and it's the great tribulation, because why? He'll set up an image the abomination of desolation. He'll set up an image in the temple and he'll say, hey, guess what? I'm not nice anymore. I am God. Worship me. And if you don't worship me and don't take num my number, you will be killed. Do you see the, the typology? Do you see the picture there, how it's relating? Do you see why theologians or, or, or scholars say, this couldn't have been written this so long ago. How could they know what's going to happen in the future? How could Daniel know? Here it is, Revelation 13, 15. It says he was granted, the Antichrist, power to give breath to the image of the beast. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause many... Can you hear this? Hear that. This image is going to be able to speak. Can you imagine that? We are impressed by you know, movies and... Type. Can you imagine a statue that has been given life that can speak? Do you think some people get, get sucked into that thinking it's God? But here it is, that the, the Antichrist gives it both to speak and cause many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. See the similarity of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Verse 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Verse 17, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast. Or the number of his name. Isn't it amazing? When I first got saved, this was hard to believe. Now it's hard not to believe it. Amen? With all the chips, with all the technology, you know, a little chip on your card, you know, that's still hard to read. But could you imagine how easy it would be for the world, I guess right now, how easy it would be for the world to take that chip? I don't have to worry about my wallet. Don't have to worry about my checkbook. Shring, you know, we like that little, what's that, uh, iPad, iPay, you know what I mean? And now, uh, what's the new thing for uh, Android has the, their pay thing just coming out. I mean, you can see why people would want this. Amen? But it's going to be religious, not just economical. And it says, verse 17, And no one may buy or sell except who has the mark or the name of the beast, the number of his name. Verse 18, Here is, the wi here is wisdom. So he's saying, listen, 
Let him who has understanding, that's us, calculate the number of the beasts, for it is the number of man. His number is 666. And I'm told a lot of computer codes have 666 in them. I'm not a computer expert, but I've been told that. The number of the image of the beast is 666. Nebuchadnezzar, hear this. Now, this is so funny. We were just watching Tim Hawkins, and he says, Tim Hawkins' name has six, and this means six, and you add three, and you have this. But hear this. This is kind of interesting. Is Nebuchadnezzar's, Nebuchadnezzar's image was 60 cubits high and six cubits wide, and there were, hear this, six kinds of instruments played when they were to fall down and worship his image. Thus, Nebi's image is a foreshadowing or a type of the beast of the tribulation period. And how many know that just like Shadrach and Meshach stood up and said, no, we're not going to worship. How many know there's going to be Jews that are going to do that and stand up and say no. And there's going to be tribulation saints that are not Jews. They're going to stand up and say, no, we're not going to worship. But guess what? A lot of those people are going to have to die. The Jews are going to run, they believe, to Petra and hide. But how many know there's going to be the 144,000 that are kind of protected, sealed by God. But how many know the rest? A lot of people are going to lose their head. And isn't that amazing? I remember, what, did anyone remember the thief in the night? Does anyone remember watch that, the thief in the night? One person? Two people? Okay. Do you remember seeing that as a person? <laughs> and you see the guillotine, you say, how could that ever happen? We live in a civilized, a peaceful religion, right? Who chops off heads? I mean, how many know that could be very real? Especially if you want to do a lot of people. How many know we, the, it's like the Bible's true. <laughs> I remember seeing that as a brand new Christian going, I mean, talking a month in the Lord going, have I been with a bunch of nut bars? This is scary. But now it's really making sense. I mean, it made sense shortly after. I just didn't know the Bible. But I'm saying is, it's amazing how even though we're, progressing, we're kind of regressing in a lot of ways. Amen? Revelation. So Nebi's image is a foreshadowing of the beast of the tribulation period. Hear this, Revelation 19.20. You just write it down and check it later. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast. Hear that, guys. We can't be impressed just by signs. Hear this. We can't be against signs and wonders. But we've got to make sure that you'll know them, what? By their fruit. It's, a sign is not the big deal. The sign of really of someone being solid is their life. Amen? And that's the key because guess what, guys? We have to realize there's a lot of people who can do signs. But guess what? Do you have the signs with the fruit of the Spirit? And these people are going to say, I, never, I won't go long. I was going to say something, but I won't. I don't have much time. But hear this. We have to be very discerning that we don't just get dazzled with signs. We need to have signs with fruit and with seeing their life. You'll know them by their fruit, Jesus said, not by their signs. And those who worship his image, these two were cast, hear this, the, the beast and, the, and the, the false prophet are cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone or fiery sulfur. The beast, I like this, gets burned in the very fire in which he sought to destroy the Jews. Don't you like that? I like that the Jesus wins in the end. I like that he came as a humble carpenter, but I love that he's coming back as a conquering king who rules the earth with a rod of iron. How many of you are excited about that day? Amen. And so, amen. You know, I'll say amen for you. Amen. Yeah. yeah. But I'm excited about that because I get tired. I, I get tired of such injustice happening in our world and yet know that God's going to come back and make it right. Hear this, eventually the Jewish nation at last recognizes that the Lord Jesus is their Messiah. I love this, Zechariah, for those who are takers, Zechariah 13.6 says this. It says when Jesus comes back in his second coming, now hear this, first coming is when he died on the cross, right? Then there's the rapture, that's where we're taken out before the tribulation, us, those who believe in Christ. And then the second coming is when he comes back to rescue the Jews, to rescue the tribulation state. He's going to come back. And how many know we get to be with them? You know that old song by Stephen Curtis Chapman, Saddle up your horses. I mean, how many excited? We're going to be riding with Jesus on white horses coming back from heaven. That's going to be cool, especially for you girls that love horses. You know, it's going to be great. 
And we're going to come back and we're going to rule. And, but it says in Zechariah 13, 6, he says, where did you, the Jews are going to see Jesus coming in power. And they're going to say, where did you get those wounds on his hands, his arms? And he's going to say, I got them in the house of my friends. And they're going to realize, oh my goodness, we miss the Messiah. But they're going to realize Jesus is indeed the Messiah when he comes to rescue them. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they won't bow to the Antichrist or his image, but will stand strong in the seven-year fiery furnace of the tribulation period. When it looks like they're going to be burned up, just as God did, just as God did with the three brave men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Jesus will stand in the fire with his people, the Jews and the tribulation saints, and he'll return at the very point when they think they're going down. And I want to tell you this, praise God for that, but how many know God is there for you when it feels like you're going down? Amen. And I'll tell you, I love that saying, it ain't over till the fat lady sings. How many know, it ain't over till it's over. As long as there's breath, you still have hope that Jesus can turn things around. I love what one pastor said. He said, he says, how many know, when, when the disciples saw Jesus dying on a cross on Friday, how many know, they were weeping, crying, hopeless. But how many know they didn't know that Sundays are coming? And we have to remember there's Sundays and where Jesus will be resurrected and he will set us free from sin and death. And how many know we have to always look for God's, you know, I always love how the Bible says all the trouble and then it says, but God. How many know we look, need to look for, you know, we usually say to God, but God, but how many know we need to say, where's the but God? Where God can change things around. He can turn things that seem impossible and he can make a way where there is no human way. Amen. You guys are tired today. You're not just. Amen. I'll say it for myself. Verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. They have frustrated the king's word and yielded their. Now, how many know this? Hear that. They frustrate him. How many know when you say no to a king or to the government, they get frustrated? So realize that. Sometimes we think, you know, can't we all get along? No. Sometimes you need to lovingly say, no. I expect, I respect governmental authority unless it breaks the law of God. Amen? Remember Peter said in Acts 6, he said what? We obey the laws of men unless they break the laws of God. He said, who should we obey, God or you? And what's the answer? God. We need to realize there is a time for a holy rebellion against authority. Now, not making our own rules, but when the authority, when the governmental authority says to do something against the word of God and it's clearly in the word of God, then we need to say, I have to humbly say no. People say to me, you know, someone said to me, Craig, you know, you have a 513C here. You know, the government can tell you what to do. And I said, yeah. And when the government tells me what to do, I will let go of my 513C. But right now, why not get a tax break if you can until they tell me what to do? Amen. Makes sense to me. But as soon as they say, hey, Pastor Craig, you want to have this tax credit, you're going to have to do what we say. And then I'm going to say, I can't go for that. No, I, no I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they may not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Verse 29. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, and language which speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into pieces. Man, this guy loved to cut people and tear people limb from limb. This guy was a brutal king. And their homes shall be made an ash heap or a dung hill, other versions say. And I mean, he loved to turn your house into a cesspool or just a rubbish heap. Because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Verse 30. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Hear this. This is the second time in three chapters that they've been promoted. I believe when we walk with God, how many know there should be promotion in our life? I believe that we should be the best employee that they have at, at your work because you are working for God and you are a man or woman of integrity and you should be the best person that they have. Maybe not the smartest always, but I think even that. We saw with Daniel, didn't we? In Daniel 1.17, that the Lord gave them wisdom and understanding and all knowledge. How many know we should cry out for that? Some of us more than others, but we should cry out for that. I cry out for that, Lord, help me, Right? We need that wisdom. We need that favor. We need that blessing. But God has promoted them, Shadrach, Meshach, and the province of Babylon twice now. 
When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego emerged from the fiery furnace, Nebi was amazed. And I think, too, since I'm kind of on a roll of singing, I think the song that was when they were coming out was, Fire. I'm just kidding. That's sad. All right. <clears throat> but he was still not converted. Hear this. He was amazed, but he was still not converted. He says there's no other God who can deliver like this. But do you notice he's sort of saying there's other gods, but no other God like this. Your God is really good with fire, with furnaces. He should have said, there is no other God but your God. How many of that would have been good? I mean, a lot of times we'll say things and we should have stopped with a period, but we keep going and say the wrong, we add to it and we should have stopped. How many know the way, what he should have said? You know what, guys? This is the second time God has done an amazing through, thing through you guys. There is no other God but your God. How many know that had been the good answer? But he says there's no other God who can deliver like your God, like there's more than one God. As we wrap up here, there are three lessons I want us to see here. The first lesson, for those of you note takers, is fiery trials will free you up from the things that bind you. Let me say it again. Fiery trials will free you up from the things that bind you or hinder you. The ropes that bound Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were burned off, hear this, only by the fiery trial. And as I said earlier, I don't like fiery trials, just like you don't like fiery trials, but I hear this, Saints, if you want to grow in Jesus, sometimes the only way we can grow is through a fiery trial. And I'll just tell you that. And so hear me. I'm not saying welcome it. I'm not saying pray for it. Oh, God, give me a good trial today, a fiery trial. Let my car just <laughs> catch on fire. No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying is when God allows a fiery trial, see God in the midst of the trial. Don't go, God, how could you? Why? Where are you at? Stop that. That's the devil. Say, God, what are you doing through and in this fiery trial? Amen? The fiery trial surrounding them. That's why Peter would tell us to rejoice in the midst of our fiery trials. 1 Peter 4.12, for those who know, takers, you don't have to turn there because I'm going to move on quickly. 1 Peter 4.12, dear and 13. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials. It's amazing how the Bible has such continuity. The fiery trials, same word. Don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through. He's probably quoting what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. As if something strange were happening to you. Hear that? We shouldn't go, what? <laughs> now, now, let me know this. I, I've done the faith movement. I've done the, TV move, the TBN movement where Learjets and everything and you're healthy and you're perfect. And how many know I love to believe that, but that isn't biblical. Amen? Now, I still want to have faith. Don't get me wrong. But to say that you'll never have sickness as a Christian, you'll never have financial hardship, you'll never have persecution, whew, then yes, Paul, who said a lot of those scriptures, really didn't understand that, did he? He says, don't think it's strange that what's happening to you. Hear this, I love this. Instead, be very glad. Wouldn't that be neat? Remember what Jesus said to do when people speak all kinds of evil against you and persecute you for my name's sake? What did he say? He said, leap for joy. Jump for joy. Spring, praise God. Leap for God that you're worthy to be, to be persecuted for his name's sake. Leap for joy. I'll tell you, I did this once. Now, I don't do it very often because it's hard for me to leap. But but I did this. When I was at the liberal church and I was a missionary, and I was a Lutheran, liberal Lutheran church, and I remember they just cussed me out in a staff meeting. And I remember just saying, God, and, I, and God told me I couldn't quit, and I was so just hurt and I was angry. But I just started being, I was like, what's that guy, Barishnikov? I was like, you know, the, 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 the little, you know, I was like, I was dancing through the sanctuary, just, I mean, I was doing backflips. I would, no, okay. I'm just prancing and saying, God, thank you, thank you, thank you. And guess what? All of us, you first, you start laughing at yourself. When you see me as a ballerina, it's pretty funny. But all of a sudden, I had joy even though nothing changed. Because why? Because I said, you know what, God? I'm going to obey this verse that says, don't think it's strange. Don't think, where's God? How could God? I'm going to see God in it, and I'm going to be joyful that I was persecuted for, what does Peter also say? Don't, be, don't think you're good if you're persecuted 
persecuted because you're a jerk, but when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, then how many know that's a great day? Because what did you say? Or what did Peter say? Great is your reward. Great reward. So you should jump around. I got a reward. Yeah, you know. No, that's pride. But anyways, you know, but you get excited because God's allowing you. He's trusting you to go through a fiery trial and be a witness for him. James said, count it all, count it all joy when you can fall into various trials. Count it all joy. For the testing of your faith produces endurance. Hupomone. That's our, we love that word. Hupomone means, pers- it means patient endurance. That you are strong. And you don't freak out in trials. How many want to be like that? I want to be like that. You know, I don't want to drive them. You know, I don't want to freak out when Kevin goes, guess what, Pastor Craig? I don't want to freak out. I want to go, God allowed it. He's going to get us through it. Trials liberate you. They liberate you. They were liberated in the fiery furnace. And the fiery trials that you and I experience will burn off the cords of sin that would otherwise have paralyzed us or held us back. Hear this. 1 Peter 4.1 says this. I love this verse. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. Did you hear that? If you have suffered physically for Christ, if you've been fired because you're a Christian, if you've been persecuted because you're a Christian, you are finished with sin. Let me tell you a story about this. There was this man, how many, how many have ever played softball? Have you ever played softball? Yeah, softballers, they don't party at all, do they? No. But anyways, so the, the, when I played softball for Jesus, we pretty much, it was beer and, oh yeah, softball. I mean, it was, everything was party. And so this guy would bring the case of beer, or he'd bring the, the keg, and it was just a party time to him. And then all of a sudden, his four-year-old daughter got killed by a drunk driver. How many know after that he didn't bring the keg or beer to the softball games anymore? Because the very sin he delighted in all of a sudden was the sin that killed his daughter. And he's like, you know what? I don't want any part of it. How many know going through trials and struggles makes us love this world system a lot less? How many know trials and struggles make you go, like all you say, I love it. The older we get to, isn't it amazing? Young people say, what are you talking about? I don't want the Lord to come back. I want to get married. How many of us older people? Come back now! Right? I'm done. Nothing in this world I want. Come back! Right? The older you get, the more you want. Because what? You're done with sin. You're just like, you know, this world, I've been there, done that. I've, I've gone to the Magic Mountain. I've seen, I've seen, I've gone to Disneyland. Been there, done that. I got the t-shirt. Not that big a deal. But how many know heaven, we're not going to be disappointed? How many know heaven, we're going to be excited? Lesson number two. Oh my, I gotta move. It was a testimony to the unbeliever. Nebi saw them in the fire and saw them not burning out or getting angry with God, but instead trusting the Lord. How many know that you and I have neighbors, students, coworkers, friends, family members that are watching us to see what you do in your fiery trial? They're waiting to see if you're going to burn out or give up on God or accuse God. But hear this. When they see that you don't burn out, that you don't get angry, they will say, how can this be? How can you go through cancer? How can you go through struggle? How can you go through pain? How can you lose your job and not freak out? How can you have, as I said, sickness in your body and not curse God? And your life becomes a witness of the strength of Jesus in your life. It can change, that witness can change the angry unbeliever like King Nebi. And it can change your neighbors and friends too. How many know our life is to be a witness? It's to be a witness of the power of God. It's to be a witness of not of that we never have problems, but that God can get us through the problems. I heard one pastor say this. We always think that God's to get us around the piles of life. But he says a lot of times God gets us through the piles of life. And we need to see that. Thirdly and lastly, they were willing to stay in the fire. They were willing to stay in the fiery furnace. Why? So they could see Jesus better. 
I love what A.W. Tozer said. It's one of my favorite quotes. I, I, it was my first Christian book I wrote, read, The Pursuit of God. And he says, no one's been greatly used. No man or woman has been greatly used until they've been deeply wounded or broken by God. And I remember hearing that going, what? But I remember the Spirit saying, that is true. Embrace that truth. And I went, okay. So they could see Jesus better. A lot of us are learning that. Most of the time, we don't see Jesus as well or as good as we can as we do in the fiery trials of life. That's when we realize that he's right there next to us. That's why we have that little thing of the footprints in the sand. And we always say, you know, we always say that, that why is there only one, in my hard times, why is there only one set of footprints? And Jesus said, what? I'm carrying you. I love what one guy said. to He says, and there's also another thing besides the prince. There's this heel marks. And he says, that's where Jesus was dragging you. <laughs> and okay, I just, I love that. <laughs> Gotta lighten it up so you get a little teary-eyed here. But anyway, don't take me wrong. I don't, I don't like trials. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't like trials. They weren't excited about it. But the more we do, the more we do, the more determined in our hearts, the more trials we go through, the more determined in our hearts it is that, that, that we'll see God in those fiery trials. And I'm learning to say, God, I don't like fiery trials, but if that's what it takes to make me a man of God and make me a godly husband and make me a godly pastor, make me a godly father, then so be it. And I'll tell you, it's so sweet. I don't know about you, but it's something so fearful in our flesh to go, no. But there's something so liberating when you finally just say, you know what, God, I'm not afraid. I trust you. I like how Job said, he said, even though thou dost slay me, even though it looks like you're killing me, God, I will trust in thee because you're a good, good father. That's who you are. We should sing that again, Morgan. Can we sing that again afterwards? I want to sing it again. But they determine their hearts that if that, that it takes the fiery furnace for, for us, for Shadrach, Meshach, to get closer to God or for us to get closer to God, so be it. I love what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 4.16. Here's this great man of God who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Two-thirds of the New Testament. Used so powerfully by God. But here's what he says. No one has stood with me but all have forsaken me. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't a party go, wait a sec, this is Paul. How could, what, how many would love to hang out with Paul? Maybe not to do ministry with Paul. It'd be a little intense. He'd probably wear us out in a day. But, but you go, man, I'd love to hang out with Paul. How come, no, what's up with these jerks that wouldn't like to hang out with Paul? But I think he just wore people out. I think it was just so intense that they couldn't hang out, hang out with him. But I love what verse 17 says. He says, but it was the Lord who stood with me and strengthened me. How many know the Bible says there is one who sticks closer than a brother and that one is God and sticks closer than a spouse and sticks closer than a mom and dad. And when you and I get that down, that he is our all in all, how many know any trial is nothing as long as we go through it with Jesus? I want to end with this. and I promise I'm really ending with this is when we studied 1 Peter, I believe it was 1 Peter, 1st or 2nd. But if you remember about the goldsmith, and when the goldsmith is refining the gold, what does he do? He puts heat to it. He makes that gold liquid. And what does he do? He allows the fire or the fiery trial to come. That gold, if it was a human, would say, what are you doing? But it li- turns to liquefy, and then what happens? All the dross or impurities come out of that gold. They rise to the top. And then the goldsmith then takes a piece of wood and he scrapes those impurities off. And the way the goldsmith knows that his work is done, the way he knows that the gold is pure is when he can see his reflection in the gold. How many know, guys, that God allows fiery trials in your life, in my life, so that we can reflect Jesus more? And when we get that down, it makes at least have us uh, have an understanding why he allows them. 
and then he doesn't become our enemy, but he becomes that goldsmith or that good, good father that's wanting you, as Paul said, to see Christ formed in you. And sometimes it takes nothing, nothing can get it out like the fiery trials. Amen? Love you guys. God loves you more. And let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. And I ask that God, even though this was kind of an intense message, we don't get really excited about hearing about fiery trials and that that's what it takes to refine us and make us like you. But Lord, I pray you'll give everyone a peace that you are a good, good father. And not that you're excited to hurt your children. That's not the reason why you allow it. But the reason why you allow it, I pray that you'll give us the wisdom, give us the understanding, sear that into our hearts and minds, that it's always for our embetterment. It's to make us better, to make us more like you, to make us be that witness, to make us demonstrate your power and how you give us that hupomone, that patient endurance to endure under trials or struggles. I pray right now for everyone in this room and I pray for everyone in the lobby and for everyone who will listen online. I ask that you would strengthen them right now. That you would give them spiritual backbone. That you would give them that hupomone, that patient endurance. That they could say like John or James, that rejoice when you encounter various trials. When they're testing your faith, it produces patience. And they would say, Lord, I, 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 I make a choice to rejoice even though I don't feel it. I choose to walk by faith in what you say, not by what I feel or not what the world tells me or not what the devil or my flesh tells me. So give your people the strength. Give them the courage. Give us the strength that we are not overcome by evil, overcome by fiery trials, but we overcome evil and fiery trials by the strength and grace of our good, good Father. Bless your people. Bless your people. And thank you, Jesus, that you didn't lie to us. You didn't say that in this life it'll be easy and a cakewalk. You said in this life you will, there will be, you will suffer persecution. There will be tribulation. But you say, don't fret, basically. I have overcome the world. And as long as you're with me, you too will overcome the world. So give that hope to your people. I pray for anyone who's going through a fiery trial right now. I pray for your strength. I pray for your hupomone, that patient endurance, as it says in James. Bless them. Encourage them. Let them see you in the fire. Let them know you better than they've ever known you because you are faithful and true. Thank you that you don't just pray for us in the fire or outside the fire and say, yeah, I'm praying for you. You actually come in the fire with us and thank you for that. Only you, Jesus, would do that. We bless your name. Bless your people. And thank you for all that you do. For it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone agreed said, Amen. Amen.